keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. I would also like to give um, a welcome this evening to uh, guest speakers as well as colleagues from uh, other uh, local authorities. We've got uh, with us Councillor Crawford from the London Borough of, uh, of Ealing, and uh, we also have online uh, Councillor Chet, who's the chair of the Health Adults uh, Joint Health Overview Scrutiny Committee. And of course, welcome to other colleagues as well and, and guest speakers. Um, okay, let's please move on to agenda item number one. Apologies for absence. Have you got apologies, please? Um, apologies from Ms. Mallinson. Thank you, Mallinson. Uh, have you got apologies for, from Councillor uh, Rosenberg as well? Uh, I think she's going to try and join online. So. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, agenda item number two um, are there any declarations of interest? No declarations. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on straight to uh, the main agenda item for uh, tonight's extraordinary meeting, and I will leave uh, the minutes uh, for later. So um, let's move on to the next agenda item. West London Trust update healing adult acute mental health beds. So at the last uh, HASPAC meeting, we agreed to have an extraordinary meeting to solely focus on this uh, on this topic. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Christopher Hilton, Helen Mangan. Um... Hi, I'm Catherine Murray, Director of Transformation at the Trust. Thank you, Maria. Thank you as well for joining us this evening and again to come uh, to this extraordinary meeting. Um, we have had the report and we have seen the paper that you've circulated for, for this meeting. So. I would like to please uh, yeah, invite you to please give us a summary of, of, of the paper that you um, have uh, submitted. And also we would appreciate uh, at the end as well, a summary to have a clear understanding about the recommendations that you're going to be put forward to the board. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Perez. Um, if we may, we're going to try and avoid me doing all the talking this evening. So I will, I will um, begin and um, with a brief, uh, description of the context which I'm with which I'm sure that the committee is familiar but just um, uh, to remind the context um, and um, then pass over to Catherine who will uh, summarize the feedback from the recent engagement activity that we've been undertaking um, the emerging responses and the nature of the paper um, is something that I will touch upon and I know that there were some specific questions uh, that members of the committee shared with us that we will uh, seek to answer in that presentation um, so we have um, shared with the committee two um, uh, documents, which uh, we will, of course, um, take as read. Um, but I, I think it's important to to explain the context that um, West London, uh, the work that West London has been doing over the last um, year or so, um, and particularly since uh, October, when we've been undertaking um, what's been described as enhanced engagement on the subject of making permanent changes to the adult acute mental health um, provision within the trust. Um, in, in particular, this relates to um, a configuration of beds that we've had in the trust now for um, nearly three years, um, and the suspension of 31 beds over two wards at St. Bernard's Hospital in Ealing. Um, these are wards, and you've heard me describe them before, for as pre-Victorian uh, wards um, that the Trust has um, been criticised for previously. Um, at the start of the COVID pandemic, we were, um, for a number of reasons, unable to staff them safely and to provide safe care from an infection prevention and control reason, and we suspended those wards. We immediately re-provided 18 beds in an alternative ward uh, in Hounslow, in Lakeside, in one of our more modern mental health units, and all of the money revenue uh, implications from um, uh, those wards was reinvested into, into other crisis pathways, and, and we'll, we'll cover that shortly. Um, I, I wanted to acknowledge to the committee, and I've, I've spoken on this topic previously, uh, the concerns that have been raised with us around the nature of the uh, enhanced engagement that uh, we have been undertaking. Um, and we, we've described in the pack um, the advice uh, we had received um, about this, um, and, and also we've had 
separate conversations that led to us um, in, in conjunction with the Joint Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee and the, and the chairs of this panel and its equivalents in the other two boards, uh, in the other two boroughs, um, extending the engagement period in an effort to try and deepen the engagement and lengthen uh, the engagement in order to um, to get more feedback. We, we've, we've heard clearly the concerns um, and the, um, the criticism of the trust around whether or not uh, public consultation um, should have occurred. Um, and we've done our best to um, highlight in, in the pack the, 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 the material differences that you think there would have been had um, that been the approach we'd been advised to follow. So, so my, my apologies and, and, um, and learning certainly for us in the event of any future transformation. Um, I'm going to ask Catherine briefly to describe the feedback from the activities that we've been done and the nature of the, the final product. Thanks, Chris. Um, so overall, we have reached over 12,800 people as part of our promotional activities. Um, and just to put that in context, at any one time... Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Shall I repeat that? Would that be helpful? Yes, please. Um, so, yes, yeah, so overall with our... Um, engagement activities, we've reached over 12,800 people. Um, and I suppose just for context, at any one time, the Trust is providing crisis and inpatient and acute care for around 180 people. Um, so that reach exceeds the number of people that would be affected in a year by, um, by the service change. Um, and importantly, we also directly contacted one, over 1,900 service users who, use Hope, who have used Hope and Horizon in the past. Um, or use our crisis team. So again, it directly affected the change and we wanted to get their views. Um, in terms of the feedback and the responses that we received, um, the vast majority of people acknowledged that they had not had experience of using inpatient services. In fact, about 80% of people had never used secondary mental health services. Um, so that was interesting to note. And we had a large proportion of respondents, about 56%, who were from the most high postcodes in Ealing. Um, and we saw more women than men in, in the people that responded to our engagement process. The feedback we received often demonstrated strong sentiments towards the proposal. And um, usefully, there were many areas of consensus. Um, and it's those areas of consensus that we've really focused on in our um, in our emerging response. In terms of what people said, over 65% of survey respondents and the majority of the qualitative responses indicated that people did not agree with the reduction in beds for healing patients. Um, and we also saw um, a great deal of support for our travel reimbursement scheme with 59% of survey respondents and a substantial proportion of qualitative responses saying that they would be supportive of it and many of those people also proposed changes and adaptations to that scheme which we were very grateful for. The main um, overall themes from the feedback so there were concerns that the proposal represents a significant reduction in inpatient beds for healing residents and healing patients and that this would have a knock-on effect around access to beds for residents in Hammersmith and Fulham and Hounslow. There were concerns over the growing demand for mental health services in general and recognition that Ealing Borough is growing and is already the greatest user of inpatient mental health services. So that added to people's concerns. There was recognition that Hope and Horizon was not a suitable environment to deliver mon modern health care. And there was questions over capacity and resources being given to Lakeside Mental Health Unit and Charing Cross Hospitals to anticipate an additional demand. There was a desire for greater transparency around the process undertaken um, to develop and appraise the options. And there was recognition that the proposal significantly impacted service users, families and carers by increasing travel time. And similarly, there was a recognition that the pro proposal will affect um, staff, particularly if they were to live in Ealing by increasing travel time. The feedback also highlighted impacts on specific, specific equality group that needed to be considered and as Chris mentioned there was also concerns that the engagement process had not been robust enough and that formal consultation was or is needed. Those are the main headlines. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to, to summarise the document that we've shared with you and, and describe the, um, the, the, the process as we understand uh, going forward. So 
Um, we welcome the opportunity and the invitation to come and um, have the feedback from the engagement activities um, scrutinized here in um, Hammersmith. Um, we plan to meet with um, uh, the equivalent uh, panel chairs in the other two boroughs to offer that opportunity, um, obviously, of course, in Ealing, um, but also in Hounslow. Um, and um, the the paper or, a, or a, an updated version of it in this format will be taken to the trust public board um, in um, the in about a fortnight's time um, in in May. The purpose of that discussion will be to consider the feedback uh, from the engagement, but will not be a decision making uh, board at that time. Uh, what what we uh, propose to do to ensure that all of the boroughs have had an opportunity to scrutinize the feedback from the engagement, um, we will um, uh, defer the uh, decision making public board until all of the boroughs and um, subject to uh, Councillor Shett's um, opinion, the Northwest London Joint Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee, um, uh, their their ability to to review what we've what we've been doing, and we will make a, a decision at the Trust Board um, based on on an evolving version of this paper. Um, I just wanted to we've described this as an as a um, an emerging response. So there are a few things just to highlight within this pack that that are based explicitly upon the themes from. The feedback that we've received during the engagement period. Um, I think we did feel and the, and the feedback supported that there was um, concern about the uh, quality of the environment in Hope and Horizon that, that supported the reason the trust was making this um, decision um, to, to uh, recommend uh, making permanent the current um, configuration. And we've shared within the pack on slides 13 and 14 um, some of the feedback that's occurred during different stages of the engagement on a qualitative basis regarding this. Um, there were concerns raised during the um, uh, engagement period um, about why we could not fix the current wards um, at St Bernard's Hospital, and I, I thought it would be helpful to share the, the work that's gone on so far. So the, the wards were um, refurbished uh, around 10 years ago at a cost of over three million pounds. Um, and that was on the in the context of St Bernard's Hospital redevelopment, which had attracted a very significant investment to build a new hospital for specialist services on the site. Despite that investment, over the last eight years, there were a number of comments made regarding the ward environments, particularly at St Bernard's, about their lack of communal space, the ward layout, the uh, challenges that we'd had addressing risks around blind spots, ligature anchor points, um, and we also had uh, consistently higher vacancy rates. Um, and the CQCs commented that we have a number of sites that are not fit for delivering modern health care, and we have regular engagement with the CQC, and, and we understand that to be a reference in particular.
and our own employees in the services in which they may work, um, and where there are, in some circumstances, uh, services that we aren't commissioned to provide, and that particularly relates to psychiatric intensive care for female patients. We we only traditionally have, have had a male pick you, and we we tend to have a relationship with CNWL for the um, the female patients presenting requiring those services. We. Um, so we just wanted to, to share that we've done our best to, to look ahead at the population growth, because we know that particularly in Ealing, um, there is a significant amount of population of, of capital development and housing development. Um, and our best um, uh, assumptions, uh, should, uh, building upon the uh, population growth over the last 10 years and what we know about the growth over the next 10 years, suggests that we would still have an above average number of beds compared with all of the other um, mental health trusts in London. We've, we've shown on slide 18, um, and uh, the, the use of the three facilities in the 18 months before the suspension and the 18 months after the suspension um, of the services, Woolsey being the Ealing beds, um, Charing Cross Hospital uh, in Hammersmith and Fulham, and Lakeside in Hounslow. Um, and I guess what you can see is the um, the, the absence of admissions uh, in Ealing, the increase in the flow from Ealing to the 18 beds that we deliberately opened in Hounslow, um, and a smaller increase in the uh, number of admissions of Ealing patients to Charing Cross, um, but not a significant change in the number of patients that are moving um, from residents of Hammersmith being admitted in um, Lakeside. Um, and, and similarly, the pattern for the changes for Hounslow residents have, have, um, have not been a significant change. Um, there was a, a number of bits of feedback um, in the um, engagement period regarding whether or not this was a cost-saving exercise. Um, despite our, our assurance um, under um, a number of occasions that this is not intended to save the trust money. Um, and we've done our best to illustrate on um, slide 19, uh, it also appears earlier in the pack, what the, the, the facilities cost previously, which was um, 2.6 uh, million pounds. The, the new ward that we've provided, which is about 1.2 million pounds, um, and what we've spent the rest of the money on. Um, and that has been spent on additional step-down beds. They serve the explicit purpose of, sort of supporting us to discharge individuals who can be moved on from acute care uh, into more community settings supported by our reablement services and crisis team, freeing up beds that enable um, admission for um, acute admissions. We've also invested in staffing for the health-based places of safety at both uh, Lakeside and in Hammersmith and Fulham, which serve the area, including Ealing, Hammersmith and Fulham and Hounslow. Um, and finally, we've put some investment in the mental health single point of access. Um, I guess the final um, gross theme that came up was the context in which we've been doing this and what strategy the Trust has uh, in respect of um, making these, these uh, changes at this time. Um, and and I, I think we acknowledge that that is a that is a, a, a fair challenge. We have our we've been pursuing a um, a strategy that was uh, developed uh, known as the like-minded strategy, and it's actually nearly ten years old now, um, which was informed by the NHS five-year forward view, and and talked about uh, improving upstream services, supporting prevention, supporting community services, supporting crisis prevention services, alternatives to admission, and um, making use of specialist inpatient services where required. That remains the strategy within the, um, the NHS long-term plan and the mental health long-term plan, but we have been challenged and the Northwest London system has been challenged to do two things. Uh, one is to um, uh, effectively mark our homework against the strategies that we had previously and refresh the understanding of those strategies um, in the context of life as we know it now, post-COVID, etc. Um, and also to, uh, to understand uh, any of the demographic changes that might have happened. That work is ongoing and, will, and is being led through the Integrated Care Board and uh, with ourselves as part of the Integrated Care System. Um, however, my my sense is that I that I 
I don't think that the strategy is radically going to change um, in terms of the the desire to provide fit for purpose inpatient specialist services and alternatives to admission where it is safe and appropriate to do so. I don't know, Catherine, did you want to just comment any more on the, the travel scheme? Because there was a bit more feedback on that. Yes, thanks, Chris. So the majority of the feedback we see received around the travel scheme um, related to um, some of the criteria and restrictions we'd put on it. So um, we the proposed scheme had limited transport means to the cheapest and most appropriate. Um, it had um, given some clarity around eligibility criteria, which included restricting to adversely affected postcodes. And then the rest of the feedback was really around the, the process that we proposed for how people might utilise the travel scheme. Um, and we've, we've been reviewing all of that in line with the feedback and, and also people gave some really constructive suggestions around what we could do to make the scheme easier. So we have removed the requirement for Ealing based claimants to use the cheapest form of travel for eligible residents. Uh, and we recognise that there's a cost implication for that, but we will we will manage that internally. Um, there should be it should be noted that the scheme and I don't think this came through um, clear enough, but we'd already provided alternative options for those that cannot drive or need to access or can't access public transport due to their age or a medical uh, condition or any other relevant factors um, and we've also so we'll make that more explicit and we've also removed the postcode um, restriction for claiming travel reimbursement and ex extending that eligibility to any Ealing postcode. Um, we're not clear at the moment what the demand for um, a similar scheme for residents in Hammersmith and Fulham and Hounslow might be as we've said in the figures that Chris presented we haven't seen um, much change in the, in the movement of patients um, being admitted out, out of their resident borough, but we're going to monitor that within the pilot period that we proposed, um, and we will look to make earlier changes to that, that scheme should, should the need arise. Thank you. There are, there are a few um, specific questions that we were asked to, to just emphasise, and I wonder if I might ask Helen to do that um, before summarising and, and taking questions from, from you all, of course. Yes, please, please join us. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you. Also, have a microphone. Thank you. Okay, to just address some of the questions I think you've asked during the course of the week. Um, so just to restate um, the finances, how much did Wolsey Wing Hope and Horizon cost pre-closure? It was £2.6 million. Pounds. Um, how much has been saved? Zero. No savings whatsoever. Um, so what has been invested? Um, and so what has been invested is mostly into the 18 acute beds Robin Ward on the Lakeside West Middlesex University Hospital site, as well as nine step down beds. Um, the balance from those two areas is 1.05 million, uh, and that's been invested into SPA and also into the health based places of safety. We have two one on the HF site, one on the uh, Lakeside site. So, separately from the 2.6 million, the Hope and Horizon programme, around 3.3 million has been invested in into crisis service and around uh, 9.7 million extra in community health services over the last three years. I think a question has been how many people have been helped since the closure of Hope and Horizon. And this is it's not an exact science, I think it's fair to say. So pre-closure, we had 31 acute beds, uh, assuming a six week length of stay. Um, that's approximately two, well, it's 265 people per year. Post closure or the, the new model, we have opened uh, 18 acute beds at uh, a six week length of stay. That is 156 people um, with nine step down beds, uh, which frees up acute beds 
Um, that is about 78 people. Um, around the HBOS, Health-Based Place of Safety, staffing, uh, those areas um, have uh, actually seen 378 people uh, on a 136 uh, under the Mental Health Act. With the um, extra investment into SPA, and that actually equated to um, one extra member staff of staff per shift, um, plus a manager, plus admin and some psychologist. The annual calls to SPA are 6,000. Um, so therefore, a rough estimate of how many people have been supported with that actual, the actual extra member of staff, which is an extra call handler per shift is a thousand calls. So I suppose taking those as total totals, that's a total of uh, 1612, 1612 crisis presentations, including 234 admissions per year. I, I would, there, were, there were two other questions raised, one of which I think I've covered in some detail around the the um, refurbishment of the, the St. Bernard site, but I, there was a specific question asked about which particular regulations were um, impacted. We, we understand that the CQC's concerns uh, that had been raised relate to particularly regulations 12 and 15 of the Health and Social Care Act regulated activities regulations, which relate to providing safe care and treatment and um, fit for purpose premises and equipment. Um, and, and then finally, there was a uh 12 and 15. um and finally we we were asked that people wanted to know what are we going to do with the building so the building has been vacated temporarily in the event that we make permanent these changes what are we going to do um the medium term plan is it is likely to be mothballed um, and used possibly in part by staff as office space and as training space we may retain a part of the building um, as a decant for use in the event of a major incident. In the long term, um, there is certainly the possibility that some of the old asylum premises may be sold for redevelopment. If that happens, if that happens, the proceeds would be ring-fenced for investment into other capital facilities, um, healthcare facilities for, for local people. But certainly the medium term expectation is they would remain as non-inpatient care uh, facilities. Um, so I think, I suppose the, the final thing just to, to summarise before inviting questions from you all is um, our understanding of the next steps and the specific question has been asked of what is our recommendation. It, it's um, summarised in the, um, the pack that we've shared uh, that really we, we see three um, options, if I can just open them up, which effectively say, well, do we reverse the current uh, temporary um, provision? That would include reopening the two wards on the Ealing Hospital site with all of the concerns that we have about the quality and safety, and also, crucially, closing the things that we have funded with the temporary reinvested revenue. Um, so closing the 18 beds at Lakeside, that, are, that we do consider to be fit for purpose and disinvesting in the HBOS staffing and the SPA and other step down and or seeking to find alternative ways of paying for some of that. The second option is to acknowledge the concerns that have been raised about including about process um, and continue with this as a temporary suspension. Um, effectively, that kicks things down the line and we would be having a very similar conversation I anticipate in due course, perhaps with um, further information. One of the challenges of that for us is that these are temporary changes that are in place and they have been temporary now for three years. Um, so technically we have staff that are temporarily reassigned um, and we have uh, new services developing and gaining ground that are not currently funded. Uh, so there are there are challenges to us in terms of continuing with a, with a temporary arrangement. Um, or the third option is to make permanent, uh, which was the trust's preferred option during the um, enhanced engagement period, um, whilst acknowledging the considerable um, concern that that has that we have heard. Um, and I guess in response to hearing that concern, 
trying to work out what additional mitigations we can put in. We've spoken um, already about uh, the potential mitigation of transport uh, to uh, try to uh, reduce the impact on residents of Ealing who find themselves admitted in neighbouring boroughs. Um, we've also um, sought to, to consider what else could we um, seek to to provide within, probably within Ealing, perhaps hearing the feedback about concern for Ealing residents and on the Ealing hospital site, um, uh, is there anything we can uh, test providing on that site? And I don't know, Helen, did you just want to mention the two options, learning from our neighbours in CNWL, which is work that they uh, have been doing over the last few months? So um, the first thing is to um, explore um, putting in place a mental health crisis assessment service. Um, as, as we said, CNWL actually moved to this kind of development last November. So we did go and see what, what they've done. They have put a service in place on the St. Charles side and they've seen about 300 people since November. The aim really of that service is to divert people who would ordinarily go to the emergency departments so the emergent, so in this case, the emergency departments at Charing Cross, Ealing, and uh, West Middlesex site. Um, the aim is to actually um, support people in an environment which is much more conducive to a decent assessment and also to decent de-escalation, neither of which are present in the emergency departments. People come in, it's chaotic there, they are agitated, distressed and um, they are pushed out quite frankly because the emergency departments don't want them in there so assessments are often rushed and not well considered so so I think this service actually looks to kind of improve the patient pathway um, and seek to offer some meaningful alternatives to admission um, and it, it's looking promising, uh, what we saw on Monday. Um, and they have started relatively small and cautious uh, with a, a relatively narrow inclusion criteria. And they're looking to expand out because of feedback from patients, which is saying that the experience obviously is, is much better um, and diversion is possible. Uh, so the target would be also to um, look at people who are admitted for short stays. So in our uh, mental health units, currently we have a, a reasonable cohort of people who, who stay be between naught and five days. So it's looking to see if there's alternatives possible for those people. Um, as I say, I think a few of us went um, on Monday, we were quite impressed as to um, how CNWL are moving on this. And it's definitely worth us exploring. The other element um, that we want to explore, and again, CNWL have done this, um, is to look at uh, the possibility of using uh, rehabilitation triage beds. So there is also a co cohort of people who use our services who stay for an extraordinarily long time, um, some more than 90 days, and some need a, a rehab. Um, but there are different types of re rehab and probably not explaining this very well, but there are um, locked rehab facilities and unlocked rehab. Uh, there's provision in Northwest London for both, uh, but the latter is, is, is usually private. What this facility um, is doing, and they opened eight beds again, similar time, is to offer a 12 week length of stay to look at a considered assessment something that's not possible in an acute ward because it's relatively chaotic to actually explore um, more, accurate, more accurately uh, what people could usefully utilise um, as a next step. So, uh, and I think for borough colleagues, um, I think what it also explores is there's a bit of a nuance between uh, people who need high support supported living versus people who need unlocked rehab. And quite often, the reason why people get into one or the other is, is availability, but, but this uh, facility would allow that to be explored in a much more considered way. So, so that's the other area that we are going to explore. 
and and thank you, Helen. And I guess the two things to say about the the mitigations are they we would need to seek funding for them. We we're following a similar um, methodology to our uh, neighbouring trust. There is often a um, a period of additional investment that comes in during a winter period, and an, uh, and this is exactly the sort of thing that that investment is used to test. Um, and then um, it can feed into our contract negotiations with the integrated care board into in future um, years. Um, and crucially, these facilities have different estates requirements to the estates that we are, are challenged with um, in uh, on the Ealing site. Um, and we feel that we may be able to provide particularly the MCAS um, arrangement because of the the different requirements for that uh, for that service. Um, so I think. As I said, the next step for us is to we'll, we'll, we'll be discussing this feedback in the trust open board. We'll be seeking opportunities for this feedback to be scrutinized in neighboring boroughs um, before a um, recommendation is presented to the board, incorporating further comments that you all and um, neighboring borough scrutiny committees share with us um, for a, a final decision uh, at the first opportunity after that. The, the current recommendation remains um, for the reasons that I think are, are probably obvious from the presentation that we've given to proceed, but acknowledging the concerns um, that have been heard and trying our best to enhance the mitigations. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christopher, Helen, Catherine, for um, your um, contributions this evening and also addressing the questions that have been raised before the meeting and also mentioning some of potential uh, mitigation measures and also next steps. Um, I know that Councillor Lord Harris wanted to ask a question a while ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. I always forgot it. Um, Helen, you you responded with a lot of figures regarding sort of investments, um, which was all terribly interesting, but I lost the plot after about the first sentence. So I'm just wondering, because I, you've obviously said it's of, it's of interest. Can you possibly produce that in an email or something so that we've got some facts and figures and a little bit of uh, flesh around the bones? Because there's no way, unless anybody else here takes shorthand, they would have got all of that down and it's obviously going to be quite relevant, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but, but also I think... Um... The headlines of that are on slide four. On the that, slide that's pack. it. That was my other point. Is yeah. please, when you're referring to slides, can you possibly refer to the pack that we have and the page numbers? Sure. Yeah. Because trying to go through all of this on a screen, trying to find what you're actually referring to, means that I'm distracted when I could be listening to you and have the information. So that would be really helpful. Now, is this about the general questions? I can ask it's two short ones. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That was just more the admin part. Any, all of the other questions that we asked at the previous pack, we, could we also please have those answers in writing? That would be really helpful. Um, it's very comprehensive, I think, the report. Um, what I just want to know is about the amount of feedback that you got. There is quite a lot of feedback from people that actually haven't um, their individuals, the, the public that don't haven't necessarily used services. Could you tell me how are those weighted? Because there's quite a percentage in some of these figures that are here that seem to be general public but haven't actually accessed services. So they might have an opinion based on not known experience. I'm just wondering if you could help me out as to how that gets weighted. So we haven't weighted anything for, for transparency we've we've reflected and shared the feedback as we've received it um yeah to be really explicit yeah uh, hello <laughs> i'm going to direct this question to you helen just because you mentioned um health-based places of study I'm online, sorry. Safety. <laughs> we don't make people study. All right. So um, on page four of the PowerPoint, you show how the money is from the Hope and Horizon Ward will be uh, reinvested into existing services. So existing services like step down beds, single point of access and health based places of safety. But you haven't actually mentioned what the impact would be of opening the beds back up. So what would the impact be? So 
So, so um, I know you directed that at Helen. I'll, I'll have a first stab and Helen might want to, to come back in. Um, for historical reasons, which Helen may know uh, in more detail than I, we um, had hysterical, we've always had um, health place bases, uh, places of safety, HBOS, I'm gonna call it an HBOS, HBOS, um, uh, on our uh, adjacent to our inpatient mental health units. Now these are suites that the police bring patients to um, when they've been um, identified behaving in a way that causes concern in public under section 136 of the Mental Health Act for a mental health assessment in a crisis. Um, historically, um, because they were co-located with the inpatient units, when the police arrived, the staff to attend to that patient and to support them whilst the assessment was happening were drawn from the wards. So we would we would pull a nurse from, from an adjacent ward and ask them to supervise the patient uh, whilst they were in the, the HBOS. Um, that inevitably had challenges to it because it meant that if, if a a ward was meant to be working with five nurses, suddenly they only had four to look after the inpatients whilst one of them was, was dealing with the emergency. So we had not, we'd recognized that problem um, and were keen to address it, which is partly why when uh, this change was made, we used some of that funding to fund a dedicated staffing team for those facilities in both the Lakeside and the um, Hammersmith and Fulham site. The advantage of doing that is that they have dedicated team there all the time. We can respond immediately to the police and and uh, make sure the patients are safely observed whilst they're in the department. Were we to um, proceed with, uh, I guess, re reverse the the, the current temporary uh, arrangements, um, I guess there are two options. We could revert to the previous uh, arrangement whereby there wasn't a dedicated staffing team for those facilities, which would have concerning uh, for what would be concerning for the trust in terms of the um the safety but it may also um have implications around delays for the police and 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 um social care colleagues undertaking assessments or probably more likely we would need to find the resources to invest in those staff from somewhere else um and that that in the current climate is obviously challenging but um does that does that answer your question councillor So I think the, the, the biggest impact is, uh, I'm trying to take it away from the money, but effectively it's around the, the, the staffing capacity. So, so the, the impact previously was we were taking away qualified staff from inpatient care. So you know, a, a ward may have five, five nursing staff providing ward round interventions, one-to-one -one support assessments and, and care for individuals on the wards, and very regularly, and we, we get between or we get around 400 uh, presentations a year under Section 136 of the Mental Health Act. So every day, um, probably um, more, than, more than that, in fact, we, we would be pulling staff away for many hours from the shift to, to provide care to the, to the patients in the, in the 136 suite. Helen, it looked like you want to say something. <laughs> yeah, I suppose the other impact is with the introduction of the dedicated teams on the two sites, we shortened the assessment time. So I think typically the assessment time in the health-based place of safety suite could have been around about six, 16 hours, which I think we did a bit of work in Lakeside post-pandemic. It uh, went down to eight hours. So we were able to um, actually see more people um, because I, it, it does feel like the demand has gone up with the 136 presentations as well as that. And we're trying to we're trying to quantify that at the moment. <laughs> um yeah, so thank you for that. That's that's clear when you repeat yourself. So it's what I'm getting from that is really is that it's a staffing issue and time. But I mean, could that not be instead of closing the beds it's not a possibility to hire dedicated social workers or an amp in that case 
last question sorry <laughs> no i think it's a it's a fair challenge and i think i think the i suppose what is absolutely clear is we did not make this change in order to fund HBOS staffing we we made this change because we we were we felt we weren't able to provide the safe care in the in the wards in St Bernard's um and and I think I've said to this committee previously had had our estates enabled us to replace like for like um 31 beds we would have happily done so um in fact we weren't able to do that we were able to replace 18 because of the configuration of the buildings that we occupy um, but what we wanted to do is ensure that we were reinvesting all of the money that was saved from those wards into crisis pathways and this was one of them um, and you're you're absolutely right and it was the, the second suggestion that i made clearly particularly with the the number of um 136 assessments that are that uh, present themselves to us we will need to, to to maintain this service. Currently, it's funded through this route. Um, we will were this um, uh, to be not uh, were we not to proceed with making this change permanent, we would have to find an alternative way of funding it. At the moment, that's not identified within the organisation. Thank you for answering my question. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Wobi. And now I've got Jim, and then I'm going to invite colleagues uh, who are joining us online. I know we've got Victoria as well, bring her with her uh, hand raised. So, Jim, please. Uh, oh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you to the team for the presentation. Um, I've read this paper closely a number of times, and frankly, I'm very puzzled by it. It lacks context. The context is Northwest London as a whole. Since you were here last, Chris and team, you would have been aware at the ICB that there's been a detailed discussion about the need for a strategy encompassing all of Northwest London, not simply one of its sub-regions, which happens to be your trust. And that's not a negative comment about the trust, by the way. It's a need for an overall strategy, not headlines. A strategy involves finance, resourcing, demand, need, and all of that you'll be as much aware of that as I was my previous life in education. But we were told no closures would go ahead until a strategy has gone out to all stakeholders for um, consultation. Now, that, that seemed to be very important from the chair of the ICB and the chair of the ICS as well. And it does seem to be that what we're getting is an advanced in one part of Northwest London in what's supposedly an integrated care partnership, not a holistic picture. And as we're all aware, similar conversations are going on in a controversial way in the other areas with um, a range of local authorities finding some of the proposals very difficult in their area, i.e. potentially unacceptable. Now, looking at the consultation, I missed in some things, you've identified service users but the trouble with mental health, like all other parts of the NHS, is that, is that we're all potential users of the service, myself included. I've not used mental health services, but I don't know whether that will continue to be the case. I know people who have been affected by that. So the public at large needs to have had far greater impact on the, the final version of this paper. Now, there are a couple of things which I think are quite striking. You went out to a lot of people, spoke to groups, but not to the community as a whole, came up with four, more than 400 answers. And I've never seen this before. Only 10% of people agreed with you. But that's, it's here, it's on this slide. Strongly agree 3%, agree 7%, um, disagree 32, strongly disagree 36 won't the public simply take a straightforward, intelligent and accurate picture? Doesn't matter what we say, we've been listened to, we go back to the board, our cares will be, our what we've talked about will be acknowledged and then set aside. We're going to go back to what our original decision was in any case. Now, I know there are mitigations, but your and my dictionary will tell us the same thing. A mitigation is a way of slightly diminishing a, a, a bad situation or decision. And that goes for transport or for anything else. 
aren't there implications about equalities? The people who are being locked out on the whole, who can't get beds, who will need them, will be poor, more likely they'll be black rather than white, there'll be people who've got to travel a long area, a, a long way, there are people who very often have lower incomes who will not be able to get time off for work to visit people they might help um, rehabilitate, take back into family or community. And what we're faced here with is a, a diminution which seems to be a leveling down, if I can put it like that. It's not a new phrase, but we're seeing it in Northwest London before our eyes here. And that worries me a lot because uh, I, I, you said, Chris, I take you as quite an honest person. You said there as that we would happily uh, expand if things were better in all of the areas. You said at the previous meeting and a short time ago. That means the what you're going for is a service which you know, because you're a practitioner, I'm a potential patient, but a long-term resident who who knows people who've used mental health services, that what you're going for is something you do not want. It's not as good as you'd like. You need more beds. And what is missing from this is um, there are no figures about demand. There's nothing about need whatever. But I do know from talking informally to people that the demand is much, much higher than it has been, likely to grow much more through the cost of living prices and its consequences, and the need will be well beyond demand. Now, beds are not the only part of the mental health service. I think we all accept that, but they are a key part for people who need to be seen soon. And given the missing of targets, at least a temporary hold to this while you explore uh, demographic trends, poverty trends, demands and need trends, seems to me the least one can go for because the damaging effects of moving something out of the biggest borough into a smaller borough with travel implications, with pulling things, as Marmot points out, from an actual deprived community so people there feel their services are being dried up or taken away, that surely is damaging. And that's something the board, given the ICB's equality commitment on paper, must take into account. Thank you very much, Tim. I um, appreciate your contribution. Um, thank you. And the various points that you have raised there. And I'm just to know that I, I agree with Jim. My, I've got a, a big concern in terms of just seeing this in isolation and not the bigger picture. We know as well of some of the changes happening in, in other parts, central northwest London. And I'm just concerned about the impact this is going to have for the whole area. And just seeing this in isolation, I think presents uh, lots of problems. That's my, that's my personal view. And um, I know we've got, um, yes. Excuse me. I know we've got people who wanted to come in, but we're actually on a particular subject. And I think we need to pursue that for a minute, if I may, about the, because we, we're making statements at the moment. We're not giving, um, having an opportunity for dialogue if we're just making statements. So I'd just like to, just to pursue this one point, if I may, that has been, has been raised. The Integrated Care Board, um, which 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 uh, you're all aware of, I can't remember who's actually who's at it, who's online, and who was there, and never, but we're all online. They, as as Jim said, and I'd just like to get a clarification on this. They said there will not be any closures. Now that's that's not to say the suspensions would be lifted. There will still be suspensions. There will be no closures of beds until my understanding was until we have a mental health strategy across the eight boroughs of the integrated care system. That's what was said at the meeting. Is that the basis on which you're operating now? Um, so, uh, Councillor Coleman, I think um, I wasn't in that part of the meeting. I do attend the um, Integrated Care Board as the representative for Ealing, uh, mm -hmm. coincidentally. But um, uh, I will... So certainly it is the case that we recognise the feedback about needing to have a strategy for North West London for mental health. Um, our, our our position is, and we are contributing to one, um, we, we've we met with colleagues from CNWL and the ICB uh, to review the strategy that has been in place for the last 10 years and to revise the strategy going forwards. Um, certainly, it was, it was our understanding that we would continue with the process that we have been in uh, with a view to uh, reaching a conclusion to enable us to um, uh, 
uh, resolve the temporary nature of the changes that, that are in place. Um, and But certainly the Integrated Care Board is going to need to um, endorse that approach. Can, if I could just come back to it, um, Helen, you were at the meeting. Um, the board said, uh, the, the understanding of what the Chief, Chief Executive said the chair and the chair said is that there wouldn't be any bed closures, um, neither Gordon nor here, um, until the um, new mental health strategy and the mental health strategy has to be probably there isn't just a cobbling to get something together it's a it's a serious piece of work which is going to be developed in a fresh way because the ICS is working in a in a different way uh, until that mental health strategy was in place there would be no bed closures and that's what we were told Helen isn't at the meeting what's your understanding is that your understanding I'm not sure if I was at that meeting. you weren't at that meeting no. forgive me I can't remember who was no, at that meeting well so it hasn't been so what I'm hearing is that commitment um and we can probably I should have looked at the meeting online before but the commitment which people here who were at the meeting heard hasn't been communicated to you because which is interesting for me about how the ICS works you have two mental health trusts in in the eight borough area um who you say you're talking more and, and certainly you've talked in this so far about what you've learnt from from cnwl in in certain areas but we don't have a mental health strategy we do have a commit from the icb that we won't close any beds until we have one has that not been communicated to you so certainly that what is communicated to us is the is the concern about the absence of a mental health strategy and that that's that has been not the commitment not to close any beds until we have one that hasn't been communicated to you uh no okay thank you Thank you, Councillor Coleman. I know we have got guests this evening, Ed, and and I appreciate people's patience. So, Councillor Crawford, you had your, your hand up in relation to this point. So, it is. Sorry, I've jumped ahead of uh, people who are far more uh, important this evening than than I am. And thank you for having me. It is just to clarify this point. You know, I, I was viewing the meeting when I heard that commitment, and, and I would just say to my my colleagues in Hampstead and Fulham who we've worked together on many of these issues over a long period of time. Um, you know, I think it's no surprise to, to Dr. Hilton and his colleagues that um, we are very disappointed uh, with the progress of these proposals, with the lack of um, formal public consultation. We've made that very clear. You know, this is a substantial change. I know why NHS colleagues are saying um, that this is a temporary change and that this needs to be done because of the CQC's uh, uh, position, uh, which is well stated, but all of these issues have been long in the pipeline, could easily have been foreseen with, with better planning. And, you know, I'm just very concerned that we are in a position now where we still don't have a full picture of the impact uh, as councillors have, have addressed this evening. Um, and as Councillor Coleman has pointed out, you know, if we are going to move to ICS and ICBs and we are going to have this strategy, colleagues on the Northwest London level, the macro level, have had years to come up with the, these strategies. They've told us indeed that they're progressing towards them. And yet we are doing, potentially doing something that is going to jeopardise the very people who need access to mental health services now. Um, whilst you know we're trying to to draw out the, this strategy and i want to end there because you've got other contributions to take council Perez. thank you uh, thank you council Crawford, for your contribution um and i mean i note as well the the common concerns that we have uh thank you for representing as well of the residents in mailing and it's good to have you here this evening uh sharing some of the same concerns that we have here in hamilton and fulham uh meryl i understand that you have uh, a point to make yeah, or a I, question to make in relation I, to I this. just want to follow up what Councillor Coleman has said um, because both in the formal ICB meeting but also in a number of informal meetings that the CEO of the ICB has had with campaigners we have had it reiterated multiple times that the there will be no bed closures until there is an agreed, and I think that's an important word as well, an agreed strategy for Northwest London. Further, and, and this did concern me in your paper, it seemed to be saying, well, there'll be a policy, a, a, a strategy that is based on a, an NHSE paper from 2015 and something from 2019, both of course pre-COVID, um, when in our discussions, both with Rob Hurd 
and also with Penny Dash, who was in, present at one of those informal meetings, it was agreed it had to be a very specific Northwest London strategy based on Northwest London data. And, and that's not reflected in the paper that you've come back with tonight. And as someone that's been at all these scrutiny meetings, it's something that I know on behalf of Hassan, I have been asking for, but I also know this committee has been asking for. Thank you very much, Marilyn. I haven't heard Marilyn, also Councillor Coleman, also, uh, then I'm wondering as well if as a scrutiny committee, we can put uh, a collective uh, request uh, that we do not want any bed closures until we have an agreed strategy. I think that would be very sensible. I know Chris wants to come back on it, but my understanding is that we have a commitment at ICS ICB level on that, and we need to clarify that because there seems to be some misunderstanding. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, I I, I recognise the, the concern and I, I and I fully understand it. And of course, as a trust, we're completely engaged in developing the strategy that you're describing. Um, I, I will also see clarification from um, Rob Hurd and from Penny about what, what commitments have been made and, and where there have been commitments made, then of course we must um, uh, adhere is the wrong word, but you know, abide by them. Um, I, um, I just wanted to, to, to add one other comment and related to the papers presented this evening, um, and it, it links to a point that Jim made and others have alluded to. So, so the paper we've just we brought today is the um, the findings of the enhanced engagement uh, process. Um, there, there is, and I hope you've had a chance to to review it on the papers that we've shared before and the links that we've shared before. A case for change document, which does, it may maybe not to your satisfaction, but it does seek to um, look at some of the demographic changes and the population changes and the demand projections that are behind the work that we've been doing. So I, I wanted to assure the committee that we're not working in the absence of that thinking, uh, but I definitely recognize the concerns about the the, the Northwest London strategy. Um, and the final point I've made around the Northwest London strategy is definitely we are committed to, to joint working across Northwest London. It's the spirit of the ICS and of the, the partnership work that we try to do with the neighboring mental health trust. Um, however, or oh, and, um, for lots of reasons, historically, for this population, we have managed our beds entirely independently. Um, and, I, and that's not to take away the need for a strategy, but it, it perhaps explains why we've been pursuing the, um, the, the, these different approaches for, uh, uh, for what we've been we're describing with regard to the Woolsey Wing compared with what our neighbours are doing uh, elsewhere. Thank you, Christopher. But in relation to this point, and Councillor Coleman, you're asking, we're asking for clarification, and you've clearly heard this evening from um, various colleagues how uh, there are concerns about that, that disconnect between what was agreed at ICB level and what we're uh, hearing this evening. So my question to you is, when can we have an answer in terms of that clarification that we're needing, we're asking for? Um, second, Bearing in mind what you've heard this evening and the concerns that we have collectively raised, will this uh, change uh, the papers that you are going to be submitting to the board going forward? And also uh, the consultations that you're having with other colleagues in other scrutiny uh, meetings. Uh, so to answer the first question, I'll write to Rob and Penny, um, if not tonight, first thing tomorrow, to, to seek some clarification. I'm very happy to share with you as the chair of this committee the feedback that they give me. Um, but but I, I hear loud and clear the what has been heard in other in other forums. Um, I, I guess oh, the commitment I made at the beginning around the the evolution of this paper is that we seek we seek the feedback and we wish to evolve. This is why we've described it as an emerging response rather than the response. Um, so certainly one of the options that is in this paper talks about um, perpetuating the suspension, I guess, rather than um, moving to closure. That is not without risk and concern. Um, and, and of course, we'll need to appraise that, not least because it there is also the, the a 
appropriate um, criticism of us that the longer a suspension, a temporary thing is in place, the more inevitable it becomes. Um, and also the, um, the challenge that it would face for us internally. But it would certainly this feedback and, and the, the strong message that you're giving will, will inform the iterations of this paper before the trust uh, um, moves to a decision point. I hear it's an emerging response and it's an organic response. Can the, can the response please include reference to tonight's meeting? Unquestionably, it? yes, it will. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank colleagues who are uh, joining us uh, online and uh, thanks for your patience. I know uh, Victoria, you've got your hand up and also Councillor Quigley, Victoria, would you like to, to make a question, please? Thank yes, you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, can you clarify something for me? Um, since these bed closures happened, um, what has been the impact on waiting lists? Have the waiting lists for these beds gone up or down or no change? Um, so, so we're in a fortunate position within the trust that we don't have waiting lists for our beds. Um, the closest thing that we have is the um, the the time for assessment or the time to admit, uh, which is monitored. Um, there has been little change to the time to admit uh, for West London Trust, uh, the patients for whom West London Trust is responsible for admitting. Um, and, and certainly we've been in a, in a fortunate position to maintain our um, avoidance of use of out of area placements. So the net, the net loss of beds is 13, is that right? I mean, how have you managed to maintain the time scales when you've lost, lost 13 beds? So I get uh, that's thank you for for raising that. Yes, thirteen one three is the um, the net change in the number of beds that we've had. Um, I guess there are a number of initiatives that we've been following during this period, including um, uh, extensive work on uh, flow through our wards, uh, to in, and including some work that we're now um, commencing with the local authority partners, um, uh, or in all three of the local authorities around supporting individuals who no longer meet the criteria to reside in the beds uh, to be moved on to the next stage of their treatment. Um, we've um, managed to maintain our length of stay. We have made use of step down facilities. We've described step down beds. Um, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge that is not meant to be substitution. That is explicitly around helping people move forward from um, an intensively nursed inpatient setting to a greater degree of uh, uh, independence um, in a supported environment in the community. Um, we've also been investing separately to this project as part of the other investment we've put in in other crisis alternatives, um, including here in Hammersmith and Fulham, the safe space that um, we have with uh, MIND uh, that provides um, uh, an alternative to presenting in crisis and to be supported in a, in a uh, better environment and a similar facility that we've recently opened uh, for children and young people. So I think there's been a, a whole series of initiatives, but, but broadly it's around ensuring um, robust monitoring of the flow through our, through our acute system. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Victoria. Do you have a follow-up question or? I have a next Thank you, Victoria. Uh, Councillor Quigley. Hi, thank you, Victoria. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, I've got a question. Um, so I'm Patricia Quigley. I'm the lead member for community engagement and co-production. And I've got a very specific question regarding um, page 35, uh, Pacific Conditions Health Issues. Do you know the page I'm talking about? Uh, unfortunately not, as Councillor Lloyd Harris pointed out, we're looking at our version rather than you. Okay. Giving. One second. So it's... In page sorry, 48, I think, of your... Councillor Quigley, do you want do you want to ask your question? All right, so I'll ask my question. Um, how much co-production was on on this paper with disabled people? Uh, Catherine, I don't I don't suppose you're able to. Well, we're looking for the reference. If you're able to start answering that. Yes. 
So I think it probably, it's, it's best linked to the co-production work that we did in the pre-engagement phase, which is the work that we did. Um, I'm trying to resist giving you another page number to, to sign page two, because that's not helpful. But um, we worked with, I think it was 270 different, um, 280, sorry, individuals were part of our early engagement process. Um, and we held over 10 focus groups, um, small meetings with service users, carers, peer support workers, um, and other um, sector organisations. And, and they helped us come up with our options, appraisal process, and the actual proposed options that we put forward um, and refining those. So, okay. there was so thank you for that. Um, the question I'm getting to is, under the specific conditions and health issues provided, where it says physical disabilities, stroke conditions, it got wheelchair bound, help to walk. Um, that's not really acceptable language, wheelchair bound. It's a wheelchair user and help to walk. You have walking aids, mobility aids. Can I, really, can I, Councillor Krieger, can I, can I acknowledge um, that I think I found the reference to what you're describing, mm -hmm. um, and th this document has been produced on our behalf by a, an external organisation, and I will feed that back to them, but I apologise for any offence caused, which is, of course, um, it, it, uh, no, it's not, I'm not, to, to anyone, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I would just advise that if you're doing this type of thing again, to do it properly co-produced, with disabled people and other communities. This is the language is um it's outdated, quite frankly. Um, and there's thing there was another word I saw. Um immobility, um arm paralysis. Um it just I'm actually I saw it earlier and I, I actually couldn't believe what I was reading. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Krieger. I will undertake to feed that back to Transformation Partners in Health and Care, and and I, I also take responsibility for not having identified it myself. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for um, agreeing that uh, action. Um, Councillor Coleman. Thank you. Uh, I'm tempted to ask what co-production means for the trust. Um, actually, I will ask that. I've got two or three other questions, but if I may just ask that first, what does co-production mean for you? So the trust, the trust view on co-production, um, of course, is, a, is around uh, working with um, uh, individuals, communities um, that um, at all stages of the process. So both, you know, the, the concept, the design, the delivery, the the, the output um, of the work. And we, we as an organisation, have a commitment to improving our co-production work, um, but we recognise that we have more to do. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing that we've discussed, I know it's going to seem a small point here, but I just keep hearing this and I just want to understand a bit better, is what the CQC actually said. Uh, you said... And forgive me if I misunderstood you, um, Chris, but you said, we understand that the CQC concerns related to, and then I think you quoted a, a couple of 12 and 15 of safety. We say that we understand their concerns related to that. I, I, I was, because I've had other people saying to me, the CQC hasn't had the same concerns. Is When you say we understand it, did you, who do you understand that from? Did the CQC actually say to you, these are our concerns and it was written down? I just slightly confused by the phraseology. Uh, so, so the CQC have said it to us about these specific wards. Um, there are a series of um, uh, specific criticisms that have been made about these specific wards over a number of reports uh, over the course of a decade. And in addition, in a not written down form, in our week, in our monthly engagement meetings with the CQC, we also have received this feedback um, regularly about about that setting of care. That's helpful. Let us clarify because I keep coming back. Um, just these are just picking up various points that have been made. That's okay. On the mitigation um, question, I don't hear any commitment to any particular mitigation. Um, I hear discussion about mitigation to be looked into, but it, it's impossible, is it not, for anyone 
to take a decision on whether they would like to support option one, two or three or something else without understanding what the mitigation is going to be. When will we know what specific mitigation is, is, is on offer? Uh, so, they, so the intention is to have the explicit um, recommendation around a mitigation by the time the trust board makes its um, dis, uh, its response to this, uh, which which is a slightly flexible timetable depending on when we can have this meeting with the scrutiny committees in neighbouring boroughs and and if need be uh, Councillor Sheth's committee for North West London, but but assuming that that trust board meeting will either be in July or September, the mitigations will be worked up by then. Um. The, as I say, I'm just picking up various, various things that have been picked up because North uh, Central CNWL is going to launch a consultation in after the summer, some point after the summer, on the Gordon Hospital. It's it's, it's stated it, it, quick. It's it said it's going to do that. It's doing a, it's doing a, it's a, shaping the consultation at the moment, and it's going to launch it. What is the difference that you understand between the consultation that they are going to do and what you call enhanced engagement? which is what's happening here. Uh, the, we've, we've attempted to examine that on slide eight in our, uh, sorry, on slide nine in our pack, eight to nine in our pack. Um, and the answer, if I'm honest, is not a lot uh, of difference, um, I guess, in terms of the length, uh, in terms of the the efforts that we made to speak to communities, we can always do more, and I think we will always be criticised for not having reached sufficiently. Uh, but certainly, the, the the I think were were this to have been a um, a consultation, notwithstanding uh, some of the procedural aspects around um, working with local authority partners and notification, the um, the there are not a lot of material differences in what we would change were we to do it again, other than the feedback we've heard from you all about seeking to work with specific communities more. It's just, it's just words. Okay. Um, the, you talked about the survey um, of, of uh, 12,800 people, and you talked about the difficulties if you were having to, you know, the difficulty of trying to go back to what was there before and the amount of money you'd need to have to rebuild the wards and so on. When you had the discussion with these people, 80% um, of whom um, were against the changes, um, did, you, did you talk to them? Did you make them aware of the different challenges that there would be of going back to the status quo or assets quo ante, if you can call it that, did you make them aware of those challenges or did they just say, no, we don't like the idea of better closures per se, or we had a more sophisticated conversation? So we, we did a number of, um, as well as getting the, the static feedback through surveys and things, we did a number of focus group and engagement events, including on, on the award itself at Hope and Horizon. And I think the conversations, it's a live dialogue isn't it so the conversations there were more thorough more meaningful and I think that's why there's an extent amount of qualitative feedback in the engagement report as well as the kind of survey so we definitely have not just relied on the survey itself I, I guess one of the things to add would be we've attempted to um, in a number of methods including in different languages in different formats in in uh, direct approach online social media and, and etc one of the interesting observations that i had with a number of people that asked the question about cost saving um which which i had felt was quite clear in the in the document so there is i think your the question that perhaps that's implied uh, councillor coleman is did they understand that we were not doing this to save costs. Perhaps that message had not come across clearly. And if that hadn't, perhaps some of the other messages hadn't come across clearly enough either. So, so that is a, a fair chance. Well, I mean, I simply ask because you're, you're, you know, you're minded not to go with the 80%. Um, your mind, and and I'm just wondering if you're, you know, saying to yourselves, well, they're well-informed people, but we just don't have the money and we can't do it. Or you're saying no, they weren't really very well informed, so we don't take any notice. Although the eighty percent said they disagreed with the closure. I, I guess it, it is an interesting question, and I guess my my feedback to that question is, I wonder if they perhaps it's more my my guess, and this is my personal opinion here, is I wonder if they 
um, understood or believed um, some of the information we uh, were providing about the rationale and the concerns that we had about um, the changes. So, so I think it's it is a question around do they, is it a theoretical concern that a number of members of the public had, legitimate nevertheless, or or is it a um, uh, the balance of, of of individuals who've used the services um, and or individuals that fully understood the implications of the the decision they were making? I don't know the answer. You, you you don't know the answer, and if you don't know the answer, you're not persuaded that they were sufficiently informed, which makes it a lot easier to ignore the ten thousand people who said they were against the closure. So effectively, you're saying. We don't really think that we I can't say if they were informed. I can't say what they really thought. I can't say if my colleagues persuaded them of that. So what's the point of what you did? As far as you're concerned, 10,000 people are against it, but you don't know if they really have any in, in, informed views or not. So you're just ignoring it. So what is the point of having done that exercise the way that you did it? I, I think your question uh, makes a makes a good point, Councillor Coleman. I think we have as you can see, taken a number of efforts to to try and and explain what we are trying to do and to and to genuinely identify individuals' concerns through the process, not just numbers, but also the themes that they rose to see how we could inform any changes that we might make to the decision that we're doing. And it, and to be fair, it has made some changes. We've we've heard around the initial engagement that was proposed to which changes were made. We have also heard a, re a request for so something to do supporting in Ealing, which we are now exploring. We've heard feedback around other mitigations. We've heard feedback around uh, strategy, which has been uh, noted today. Um, so I think we have heard the, the, the themes that go along with some of those numbers, uh, and they will be informing our ongoing thinking. Just a final question, if I may. Just, thank you for that. We're losing... Uh... 42% of the beds on 30, we're using, was eight, 13, we're losing, eight, we've got 18 new ones, 13 net loss, 42% of the beds that were there. We're losing 13 acute beds. Do we need them? You talked about demand, you talked about um, need. From your analysis of demand and need, do we need these 13 beds? Uh, I think we can manage without them. Don't need them. I don't think we need them. Because the need, the demands that people have can be sufficiently well met elsewhere, or the demand just isn't there. Uh, because we have been able to manage uh, within the bed base after the reduction um, for the past three years, our modelling suggests with the, the work that we're doing and in, in including the additional work that we're doing around um, flow and support, that we will continue to be able to work within our bed base uh, for the foreseeable. When you say we don't need them, do you mean that the people who would have benefited from them are getting the same or better outcomes from the other services you're providing now? Is that what you mean by not needing them? Or is there something else that you mean? Um, so so we, we always only want to have individuals in our beds at the time that they need the service that the beds are intended to provide. Uh, so, um, so needing a, 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 the containment of um, a crisis inpatient mental health admission. Um, I, I'm confident that, and certainly the evidence over the last um, three years has um, so would support this, um, that we are able to manage within our bed base. And so we, you know, we, we operate uh, consistently, able to admit the patients that need admission and able to support individuals who don't need admission in other settings. So, so in short, I think, yes, in terms of outcomes. If you're able to accommodate them in your, in your, in your smaller bed base, that suggests that either you had a lot of capacity for previously, or there are fewer people who need the support of the beds now. But what is the reason that you're able to accommodate them? I think there are two elements. One is we were and and remain today, even with the suspended beds, um, uh, on the higher end of uh, organisations with beds, um, and that the the bar charts from NHS benchmarking that's included in the pack illustrates that. Um, I think the second thing is it's not that the the overall demand for individuals having a crisis in mental health is falling. On the contrary, it is rising. But modern mental health pathways suggest using um, uh, less restrictive alternatives to an admission if it can be provided. So that includes uh, today uh, and at any day, we are supporting uh, around 175 individuals in a virtual ward for uh, mental health crisis. That's been 
standard practice uh, for nearly three decades, and 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 that's that's an alternative. You know, the crisis assessment and treatment team support is is one example. Um, as is also some of the the admission alternatives and the crisis house that we have in in Ealing. So the demand is is there and continues to rise, and and we've modelled for it. But I'm confident that we that for this specific type of bed that we um, are able to manage within the reduced bed base. So you're saying that the people who would have used the beds are now being supported in a different way, and the outcomes they're getting are as good. Yes. Yes. So, why do you need the other thirty-one, the other um, beds, that the eighteen acute beds? That you, why did you open eighteen acute beds? Why didn't you just close thirty-one if you're able to manage this and and get a better results in a different way? Uh, but so, so I just to be really clear, I I don't think we could manage with thirty-one fewer beds. I think we can manage with eighteen. Uh, sorry, with uh, eighteen of those reprovided. So I think we can manage with thirteen fewer beds. That's and the the the, the, the fact that you can manage with thirteen fewer beds is based there was the work done but was there work done beforehand which said we anticipate that this will happen and we therefore expect to achieve the same outcomes in a different way or is it more the fact that you've seen the beds shutting and you've been able to do things in a different way and that's what's telling you that you feel you don't need them if i'm honest a bit of both so we had done some extensive work beforehand looking at what is the bed base for our population within the trust uh, and also what is um an appropriate length of stay for an individual in crisis in an inpatient setting, mindful that they will get alternatives to an admission beforehand and also um, aftercare at home afterwards. Um, I think the other, uh, so length of stay is a, is a particular piece of work. The other piece of work that was ongoing before all of this started, but is also kicking off again now, uh, is around reducing individuals who we think don't need to be in a bed at all because they actually need to be they're waiting for housing or they're waiting for a, um, a, a complex package of, of social care support or some of the rehabilitation interventions that would be perhaps in a, lo a, a longer stay mental health facility. It's a smaller proportion of our patients, but that, that, that work both predates we have learned from and are continuing uh, this, this exercise. Thank you very much. Chair, if I may, that's really helpful. Thank you. If I may just, it, it, I think this is now... This, this discussion comes down to now whether the beds are needed or not. And I mean, I think that's what it's, that's what's been said, that whether the beds are necessary. And that's where we need to have, a, that's where the, the future discussion needs to take place. It's going to take place in the consultation in Westminster. It's going to be taking place because they're approaching the consultation in Westminster in a different way from which this engagement and then enhanced engagement was taken. You've, did you, you know, forgive me, but you know, you bodged away into this and you know, doing your best to, to make something out of it proper now. And I accept that you accept that we've talked about it. Um, but it's um, the discussion in Westminster is that they're going to start off in a more sophisticated way about whether the how many beds are needed and what is actually needed. And I think we need to learn from that before any final decisions are taken. So I would, my suggestion would be that the committee recommends that we look at what happens in Westminster in terms of a consultation. And we look at the fact, and there's going to be a lot of discussion about need of beds and 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 the analysis done there before any decision is taken. Just difficult though it may be with the staffing and other issues you've presented. We wait until that happens before any final decision is taken on whether the beds are finally shut here. And also the integrated care partnership is which is setting the strategy for the brave new world of the ICS, which we're now or living in or being shoehorned into whatever is going to be focusing on mental health as one of the issues and they're going to be coming up with they're going to be driving if you want the strategy and it would be i think a mistake and you touched on this for us to, to accept that the bed should be shut until that strategy is in place so uh, you know no surprise surprise here there but it, 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 I think you, you need to wait a while longer if it started off in the right. And integration, by the way, everyone talks about an integrated care system as if it was integration between the NHS and the councils. Of course it is, but that's the, you know, what you might call horizontal integration. But actually, I'm quite clear, it's all about integrating the different parts of the NHS. And you and CNWL work sort of together, but I guess in a brave new world, you're going to work in a very different way. And that's what the mental health strategy will lead to. Um. I, I welcome the clarity of your uh, recommendation, um, uh, Councillor Coleman, and, and my interpretation of that is, is to um, suggest to the board that it continues uh, on option two, which is to maintain the temporary suspension pending more information. 
um, and, and the strategy and uh, etc. I'd be interested, were the panel minded to make that recommendation on your views about future engagement activities of this type or future consultation? I'm not, I'm interested in your views on this as a panel. Um, given the activity flawed, however, and we acknowledge the flaws in the process to date, but I, I, I would be interested in your thoughts about recommended steps when that information is available. We've got that suggestion in terms of the recommendation of the position that the the pack takes. The hashtag takes. So, are we in agreement? So, are we taking a vote on that, or we just have a council poll? Council poll. Um, I need some governance guidance on this. Do we do we take a vote? Unanimous. If it's not unanimous, then we have to take a vote. So, are we? Is there consensus? In terms of Councillor Coleman's suggestion, yeah, yes. But you've got to ask it. consensus. Yeah, that's what that's, that's what I'm asking. Assume. No, that's what I'm asking. Is there, no, that's why I asked the question. Yeah. Is there consensus? I'm gonna, and are we agreeing this? Yes. yes? Is there consensus? Yeah. Colleagues who are joining us remotely, are you in agreement? Is there consensus? Yes. Thank you very much, Lucia. Yeah. Councillor. Yeah. Okay. Not now to. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. For I invite other members of the pack to for their contributions. Uh, I did agree to finish at about half past eight because I know that some colleagues have got to travel this evening. So are we all happy to extend the meeting for fifteen more minutes? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think what I what I quickly want to say can follow from what Ben was proposing, but it also follows up from what Victoria said. One of the issues that hasn't come up that I think is quite crucial, and it does relate to data, um, which I think is very thin on the ground, um, is the issues of continuity of care when people are moved outside their area, given that continuity of care whether it's a physical or a mental issue is important, uh, issue is important, but vitally important for those with, with mental um, health issues. So, so some, some information on that, but that also then relates to readmissions and whether there's been a change in the pattern of, of patients being readmitted when they are not um, being admitted initially into um, facilities near their home, and whether there's any analysis of those patients in terms of their BAME communities that they come from. And I raise that in part because, and I think, sorry, it's on the council papers, pages 36 and 37, um, coming strongly from the BAME community, communities, a feeling that the decision has already been made and a strong feeling coming from Ealing people um, that they've already, there is a perceived loss of services in general in the area, which obviously also relates to the, the threat that there was to Ealing Hospital, but also what happened during COVID, which was the removal of services from Ealing Hospital itself and if one and it's certainly in our submission we raise the point that marmot makes about what happens to communities when they actually have services taken away from them so it, it's you may not want to answer that now but i think it builds in to the questions that ben was asking you to address uh, I, i'm probably Thank, thank you, Meryl. I'm probably unable to answer the numerical elements of that, but I do know that we are examining readmission data um, uh, and, and are able to look at the current trends for, for readmissions. Um, uh, 
what I don't know is whether we're cutting it by um, ethnicity in the way that you've suggested. So, so I will take that back to our working groups um, to, to look at the, the readmission data. But um, I, I think your point about continuity of care is, is absolutely heard and understood and is, um, is of course, one of the concerns about cross-border um, admissions, even within the natural clinical flow of the trust. We have sought to mitigate that in some ways, but we, and, and actually some of the agile working that the trust has and the fact that we're able to maintain connections um, in some circumstances with inpatients in one borough with their community team in another has been facilitated during COVID with the technological advances, but we, that we can't rely entirely on that. So we, we will come back with um, some more numbers probably. That, sorry, that it falls partly from the question um, Merrill raised and which um, Ben Coleman had asked earlier. And we speculated about the 80% of people who did not approve of the proposal. Now, that's quite important because one of the, of the, the real question marks for the NHS at the moment, and I think this is more particular for mental health than for, say, somatic health, if I can put it in that way. Is, is a lack of, of the loss gradually of trust in the service. And I actually don't think myself that's the NHS's own fault. Um, money and things beyond the NHS are hugely influential here. But uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm worried about is if such a large number of people said no, how are you actually going to keep in touch with those people so people don't do what I suspect is happening, is lots of people don't bother to go anymore. They self-medicate in ways which are often entirely illegal and very damaging to communities. When the, um, when the orthopedic hub was being talked about, there was a, a lot of work about that. We contributed to that. There was quite a lot of changes made. But one thing I'd notice is that those of us who put submissions in got individual responses which kept us on board and told us that going forward on key things, which like travel, for example, we would be collectively uh, involved. I think myself, if you look from deprived communities, they've said no, and you say, oh goodness, you said no, but this is our decision, then you lose the trust permanently of those communities. So you must find a way of re-engaging those people so they actually don't feel they've put a lot, lot of thought, come up with something, was turned down and rough. I mean, going forward for you, for mental health, that's quite an important thing to do well. I, I, I think that's a great suggestion, Jim. And I don't know whether the... Um electronic survey approach that we used enables us to do that. Uh, uh, Catherine's shaking her head, so possibly not. So it, 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 whether we are able to use the exact mechanism that they did in the um, orthopedic consultation looks like it won't be available to us. But I, I think we definitely need to be feeding back, irrespective of the decision, even if the decision is to delay, to explain the thinking, the logic, the feedback, the etc. I, I fully agree. Sorry, just to clarify, I was slightly shaking my head because I think um, those groups that you're describing, Jim, we're less keen to use some of the surveying. And, and so actually, I think what's needed is more conversation with them. And we can use partners like Health Watch or um, perhaps community champions, those sorts of groups to, to have a more meaningful conversation about what we've taken on board and what, and what remains a challenge. Okay, colleagues, thank you very much. Um, do we have any further questions and comments from colleagues who are... Uh, remotely no okay thank you very much um so just for the purpose of clarity and also next steps and actions i would like to sum up some of uh, the agreed actions that we have uh I'll request this evening and please uh, do interject if, if, if i'm missing anything so i know councillor lloyd harris requested four um questions to be submitted in writing for the questions that we'd already asked, and, uh, and Dr. Hilton came back uh, and answered how as well with the response. So if we can have those in writing, that's what I would 
edit the minutes and we have something called take note of the minutes. Thank you very much. So is that is that agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the next one, we definitely need clarification in terms of that mental health strategy. There seems to be a clash between what has been said at a more strategic level and what we've heard tonight. So are you going to be seeking that clarification, please? Thank you very much. You've also heard uh, this evening from uh, various members of, of HASPAC, the, 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 uh, some of the concerns that we have. And you can you please confirm that you will be including this uh, in the emerging response that you are putting together? Yeah, so I think we need to include an explicit piece of information in the response that, about this meeting and also the board's consensus view around option two. And we will do that. Thank you very much. I also know that we um, we need we are, we are making please a, a, a request uh, following the serious concern raised by Councillor Quigley about the use of language which is not inclusive. Uh, a conversation with colleagues from your transformation partners and uh, the importance of having a focus on co-production and and changing that language, please. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we've also uh, requested from Meryl, you want more breakdown, a breakdown of data, no? Focusing on, on, on Bain communities. Please. Um, it was about re-engagement of those people who took the trouble to submit in the first place. And that might be seen as an element of ongoing co-production. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Coleman, anything else that you wish to add? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate I appreciate the consensus. So great. Thank you very much. So those actions have been agreed, but please hold on because we still um and before I move on to the next agenda item, I wanted to thank a guest that have joined us this evening. Uh, Councillor Crawford, thank you very much for your contributions. And as I said before, I know Councillor Kitten is, 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 has joined us uh, online. So thank you for uh, participating and engaging with us this evening. It, it, it's good. Um, okay, so the next agenda item would be minutes. Are those minutes approved? And I know there were some actions that um, you had agreed from the last meeting. So, if I want to yeah. cancel it, Perez, I can't remember what they were, but okay. I know we have attended so to them. The minutes, may I write them back? May I write to you with those responses? Chair, if I can help, yes, uh, those actions have been completed. Okay. okay, great, excellent. Great, thank you very much. So, are the minutes agreed? Yes. Great. Oh, Thank you very much. Um, and then fine, uh, finally, we have agenda item number five, uh, the work program. Do we have? It was just if there were any suggestions. But... We've had some suggestions at the previous meeting, which are in the minutes. Yes, Councillor. Quick uh, question on that one. Uh, and I raised it with David um, by email. It would be most useful if what if we could do what we've done before, which is actually have the items in the works program so we can actually decide which ones we would like to maybe group together for particular meetings. Because saying here committees asked to consider the items, well, what are we considering? Because there's nothing actually there. That would be really helpful. Because then we take ownership of what it is, but we can't just say yes if we have got no idea what's there. It's a blank sheet. Um, the point of this item was to just take any suggestions and then the long list will be circulated to all the members. But you, would it not just be easier if you had whatever the amount of items are, you just actually add it to that, which is what historically we've done? It will, yeah, sorry. It will be, it will okay, thank you. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Thank David. you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, and finally, agenda item number six, dates of future meetings. 
do these need to be approved? It's just a note. Just, okay, please. Oh, okay, so please note the, the dates that we have for future meetings. So I think uh, that's the end of business for, for this evening. Chair, I think. Oh, Councilor yes, before we finish, before we finish, something very, very important that I cannot miss. And I may ask Councillor Coleman as well. Uh, to, to, to give some words. So we know that uh, our strategic director of social care is is retiring. Is a veteran. So uh, I think it's her last week. Yes. As uh, I was hoping that she would join us this evening, but um, I hope maybe she's watching online. And I wanted to. to, to... <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Well, it's going to be recorded and it's going to be in the digital archive. So I just wanted to to uh, note uh, a massive thank you very much for all her contributions and her hard work. Uh, Hammersmith and Fulham, I'm sure that is echoed by all members of, of HASPAC and by other colleagues. Councillor Coleman, do you, do you want to add something? Just Lisa, yes, Lisa Redfern has been an absolute um, force for good in the entire time she's been here as our director of social care. And I'm very upset that she's now going to be retiring. Um, she she came in, uh, I think, a month. She got the job a month before, month here, a month after I got the job, as it were. And we, one of the first things we had to do together was make the um, moving away from the tri barrier. In, in adult social care to a to single borough, all the things that we thought it would be for our residents, starting with very successful, which she made very successful, free home care. Uh, and it's and from there, she's just gone strength to strength. She's not just an incredibly professional, detailed person who has great grip. Um, she's also a very caring person and a, a very responsive person. It really, it doesn't just do things, holds people to high standards, not just that's what you do if you're professional, because that's how you get the best for residents. And she really has always put residents first. And I also need to say about COVID that um, there are simply things that we did as a council um, in COVID, shutting the care homes, saving lives. We lost 50 people before we shut them. And she worked with colleagues and she worked with the Director of Public Health to do extraordinary things about testing. She made, made sure that everyone got PPE and all our carers got PPE so they could keep the people they're caring for safe. She made all our care homes got PPE. They did not pay for this as they did in other places. Um, she made sure that we got lots of pharmacies offering vaccinations, which other places weren't doing. I genuinely think that what she did um, helped save lives. And it's not just that she helped make people's lives better, but she actually, there are people now living who wouldn't be alive if it weren't for, for Lisa and, and also her colleagues who worked on these things, but she led a great team. So she will be very, very sorely missed. Um, and uh, we, we'll, we'll move forward nonetheless, but she's made a huge contribution to this council. And I, I know I'm very grateful to her. And I'm, I, having talked to all of you, I know you all are as well. So I, yes, let's put that on the record from me. Thank you. Um, I actually had a meeting with uh, Lisa yesterday. Um, I'd like to echo actually everything that Councillor Coleman has said. Um, and I said to her, I thought she was outstanding. I don't know what the council, why the council is allowing her to leave. Um, we, we've had our, a few discussions over the years, but I think she's in a, she was in a very, very difficult position. And I think she's made significant contribution to the well-being of the residents of this bar. And I don't think it should seriously be underestimated the impact she has had on them and also on her staff. So whoever takes over, uh, I'll be supportive of them. I will be critical where need be, but those are pretty big shoes to fill. So I hope she enjoys her retirement in the Himalayas and elsewhere. So good luck to her. Thank you very much. We also have Councillor Quigley. Thank you, Natalia. Well, I think I have to follow up uh, and agree with what Ben and Amanda have said. Um, on a very personal note, um, as most of you know, I shielded through the pandemic and uh, Lisa was incredibly su supportive to me and, and many, many other residents in the bar. And I do believe that she, she and her team were responsible for saving people's lives and actually keeping us, making me feel safe in my own home. And that's, you know, that's a very special thing to do. Um, I'm very sad that she's leaving. I really am. And I'm going to miss you, Lee. And thank you so much for everything you've done, not just for me, but for the residents and the counsellors on both sides. So um, whatever you do in the future, I wish you the best of luck. 
and I look forward to hearing your stories. And thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Quigley. Chair, if if the, if the slight the slight possibility that she's not planning to watch the video of this meeting, we ought to at least encourage her to watch the last few minutes. Yes, definitely, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Dr. Hilton. I, I just wanted to add on behalf of NHS partners our best wishes to her for uh, her retirement and uh, thanks to her for her clarity of messaging and <laughs> we um, and personally I spoke to uh, Lisa before I applied for my job and she was enormously uh, supportive and helpful so I just wanted to, to add the thanks that you've all given to Lisa and wish her well for the future. Wonderful thank you very much all uh, lovely words and it's impactful as well, and, and, and the legacy uh, that she leaves behind, well, she has saved lives. So, Lisa, I really hope that you watch this uh, recording yes. in the future. <laughs> Great. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, all, and thank you, Lisa. Thank you all. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening.